Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to be talking about Oort's Cloud. The location where most of the comets, if not all of the comets, originated at some point in history. Today we're going to be discussing what exactly is Oort's Cloud, how it was originated, and right now you're actually watching one of such comets passing by Mars. This happened back in 2014, and now it's going to go closer to the Sun, and then possibly go back to its uh, origin in Oort's Cloud. So let's talk about this unusual area in our solar system, and welcome to What The Math. So this comet right here is known as uh, Siding Spring. In, uh, back in 2014 it actually passed by Mars and then it's going to go back to its location. I'm going to show you its orbit here. Uh, somewhere far, far away from the Sun. This is actually a very elliptical orbit and the location here is um, something like five to 6,000 astronomical units away from the Sun, which is obviously uh, five to six thousand times the distance of Earth from the Sun. Now, today we're going to be creating Oort's Cloud and I'm going to talk a little bit about its origins and also about what exactly it is and what exactly we know about it. So, um, we're going to select our Sun and place a bunch of objects in orbit around our Sun that will actually represent two regions. One of these regions is going to be known as the inner Oort's Cloud. It's a little bit uh, different from the outer um, Oort's Cloud. And here, what we're going to do is create a ring, or actually a torus, that is going to be um, at a distance of about 2,000 to 20,000 astronomical units away from the Sun. And we're going to create a randomly generated torus right here. And I believe it's been created, but it's kind of hard to see, unfortunately. It's right there. You can kind of see some of the particles, but it's not showing very well because I think I may have uh, chosen the particles that don't reflect sunlight very well. So let's see if we can do this again, maybe a little bit better with slightly better particles. Or actually, the best way for me to do this is to change the sun into a black hole because it's actually the sun's reflection that's causing them to be so dark. But here you go. So this right here is the inner Oort's cloud at uh, a distance of about 2,000 to 20,000 astronomical units. Now remember, the farthest objects that we've actually discovered is uh, Sedna. And Sedna is at a distance of approximately... 471 astronomical units with uh, about 0.84 eccentricity. So this is farther away than Sedna, and Sedna might actually be one of the closest um, inner Oort's cloud objects to us that was brought to a little bit closer to uh, to the sun with time. So this is the outer system, outer Oort system, and now we're going to create the inner Oort's cloud, and it's going to be, uh, let's change the color actually, let's make it a little bit different. So this will now be actually a sphere, it's going to be pink in color, just to differentiate from the inner cloud. And it's going to be at a distance of 20,000 to 50,000 astronomical units, or maybe even further. So theoretically, we think that Oort's cloud can actually reach a distance of about one light year away from, from the sun, and about a fourth of a distance to the closest star to us, which is uh, Proxima Centauri, which I actually am going to place because we're going to be talking about um, stars in a few seconds. So here is Proxima Centauri, um, and there is the Sun, and this is a distance of about 4.2 um, light years away. And what we're going to do is, well, first let's actually change this into an object that doesn't produce any light because our Oort cloud has actually disappeared. So there we go. So there's our Oort cloud, and um, you can kind of see that it's actually very large in terms of um, the actual size. And not only is it large, but it actually contains several trillion objects. That's trillion with a T. And that essentially means that there's a huge amount of objects here, a huge mass here that um, basically orbits in a very unstable orbit around our sun. And once in a while, stars like Proxima Centauri or any other stars that come relatively close to our sun may actually dislodge one of these objects and then send it toward our sun. And this is how many of the comets are born. 
a lot of them come from the outer Oort cloud and they can come from any direction, but some of them come from the inner regions as well. And so this is why we actually differentiate comets into two types. The inner comets that usually come from within uh, the inner Oort cloud or even closer, maybe even Kuiper's belt. And these comets usually are uh, defined by having what's known as the ecliptic plane, which usually refers to the idea that they orbit in the same plane of orbit as all of the other planets. So in other words, this, this is the ecliptic plane. But if they come from the outer Oort cloud, or if they even come from the inner Oort cloud, but uh, are from farther away distances, they can come from any direction. And many such comets exist, and we've discovered many of these comets that have very, very long periods and very eccentric orbits and can come from any direction. And these uh, particular comets are actually what are of the most interest to us because they come from the Oort cloud that has existed around our sun for at least 4.6 billion years. Now, um, it's called Oort Cloud because it's named after the Dutch um, astronomer by the name of Jan Oort, who basically talked about this idea back in the 1950s, but originally it was actually developed by an Estonian astronomer by the name of Ernst Opik, who basically defined these long period comets and talked about how, well, it doesn't seem to make sense that we have these comets that come from everywhere, and if they did come from everywhere, why are they still around? How can they have not been burned by the sun? And how come they're still, you know, there? After the billions of years that uh, of our sun, sun's existence, all of these comets should have actually disappeared. But uh, he then realized that there must be some sort of a source of cometary uh, bodies, and this source was later defined as the Oort Cloud. And the reason we get these comets is because all of these objects that you see orbiting around our sun are very, very loosely connected to our sun uh, gravitationally. So anything can actually dislodge them. A passing star, Proxima Centauri, or even our own uh, Milky Way, the galaxy, specifically the supermassive black hole at the center, which we're going to place here as well, just for fun. So let's go to a distance of about... Um, 22,000 light years away and place Sagittarius A star right there. So even our supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy is actually powerful enough gravitationally to dislodge these comets and to send them toward our sun. And uh, this does happen quite a lot and this is how many of the comets are actually born. And I guess the main difference between the outer Oort cloud and the inner Oort cloud, which here is green and white, is that the inner Oort cloud contains as many as tens or even hundreds times more comets um, than the outer cloud, and it does actually replenish the, uh, the outer region. So once in a while these comets escape here, and then they come back to the sun as soon as they get gravitationally dislodged by a passing star or by our own supermassive black hole uh, Sagittarius A star. So many things can actually create comets, and in many cases, these comets will often come from the outer uh, Oort cloud. And in terms of composition, for the most part, all of these are made up of mostly ices. So they're not actually made out of silicon, so like you can see here. It won't let me change this though, unfortunately. So they mostly are made up of things like methane, ethane, carbon monoxide, even hydrogen cyanide, so basically different types of ices and of course water as well. Uh, but about one to maybe 2% are made up of rock. We actually found at least one comet by the name of 1996 PW because it was discovered in 1996 that was actually made up of rocks, so silicates essentially. And many of these products uh, or many of these objects are a product of exchange of material between the sun which is somewhere right there in the middle, and other stars, such as, for example, Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri, um, specifically when they were actually being created. So back then, there were quite a lot of... Let me, let me just actually create this here. Quite a lot of different stars that were formed in the same region. So here's, for example, Proxima Centauri with its own Oort cloud. And with time, as they were basically moving around each other and passing by relatively close to each other, some of the more, more massive stars, like for example our sun, which is a little bit more massive than the neighbors, captured a lot of these objects and claimed them for, for itself. 
And so our sun actually probably has more objects in the Oort's cloud than, than Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri, simply because it's a little bit more massive and simply because even though they were formed in the same region, uh, our sun decided to capture more for itself. And about 90% of all of these objects were actually captured from uh, the protoplanetary disks of other stars, like, for example, Proxima Centauri. Although maybe not this one particularly, because we don't really know if Proxima Centauri was in the same region of uh, stellar creation as our Sun. But in other words, a lot of these objects may have come from the same nebula that created our Sun, but probably from the other stars. So if we study these objects, we can actually discover the composition of stars that were created at the same time as our sun, but that are not our sun. And so capturing these comets and even studying them might actually give us an idea of what the birth cluster of our sun was like and where it was actually born and what the nebula uh, where the sun was created contained as well, or even tell us about the actual star that exploded in supernova to create our sun, which obviously happened some sometime uh, five-ish billion years ago. And so, well, anyway, before we finish this video, I actually wanted to talk about two more concepts. One of uh, such concepts is actually more of a conspiracy theory. And because there are so many comets out there and so many have come to our star, many scientists started assuming that there, were, there was some sort of an object orbiting here. Let's actually maybe make it happen here. We're going to place an object called Nemesis right here. Um, and basically, this was an, ass an assumption that's, that was made um, about a decade ago. That there was an object that was very massive, possibly even a star-like object, that was dislodging these comets and making them come toward our sun every few million years. Specifically, I believe it was every 26 million years. Um, and another proposition, a very similar proposition, made uh, an assumption about an object called Tyche that did the same thing. Now, within the last few years, we actually were able to discredit these assumptions. First of all, we uh, realized that there was probably no actual repetitive pattern of uh, 26 million years. So this was something that was just an assumption that was not really scientific. And uh, on the other hand, we also had this very big analysis of nearby sky known as WISE. And during this analysis, we realized that there were actually no large objects within um, within about several light years away from our sun. So Tyche or Nemesis don't actually exist. At least so far, we haven't been able to found, find them. And the only other object that may cause these perturbations is Planet Nine, which might be a little bit closer to the sun and will not be uh, would not be responsible for dislodging uh, the the uh, outer Oort cloud objects. So, so the majority of comets are actually formed from the interaction with other stars or with the Milky Way itself. Now we know that uh, one day the probe by the name of Voyager, which I'm going to place here as well. So there is Voyager, which is actually not very far away from our sun yet, it's somewhere maybe around here, is actually going to reach um, the Oort cloud. And this will probably happen in the next 300 years. But unfortunately, by then, it will not have any nuclear fuel left to do any science. And all of the probes will actually reach Oort cloud at some point and will probably fly through the entire Oort cloud in about 30,000 years. But once again, we won't be able to study it. And by then, most of us will probably not exist anymore. And I guess one last thing I actually wanted to mention is in relation to the total mass of these objects. If we were to co combine all of them together, we would get something that would be this big. Let me j actually just make it for you. So I actually just made a separate object named Oort Cloud with a total mass of what the total mass of these objects are uh, is. So here, the mass is about five masses of Earth. In other words, if we were to combine every single one of these trillions of particles into one large object, it would be this big. It would be bigger than Earth, it would be bigger than Mars, and it would be more massive than uh, every terrestrial planet in our solar system, but obviously not as massive as either one of the um, gas giants or ice giants. It's not even as big as Uranus, which is the smallest of the ice giants. In other words, the total mass of all of the Oort cloud objects is actually not that big. But obviously, for to combine all of them, we could create a new planet. 
And well, anyway, that's all I wanted to do in this video. I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what Overt Cloud was, what we know about it, and what you can actually discover here if you were to one day make it here. And hopefully one day we'll be able to study it in a little bit more detail using one of the future probes that we send there. Anyway, hopefully you learned something from this video and hopefully now you know a little bit more about Oort Cloud and what's out there. I just exploded this planet. It's going to create a beautiful explosion any second now. And we're going to finish this video here. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And anyway, let's finish this video by colliding this object with our beautiful planet Earth and basically finish it here. So we're going to maybe launch our planet Earth this way, going towards Oort Cloud, the planet, and see what happens if they collide. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you still haven't and share this video with someone who enjoys learning about space and science through video games. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.